I'm Doug Dangler. I'm the manager of the ASC studio, uh, where some number of our uh, guest hosts today will be uh, or have been recording their podcasts. So I'm going to do some brief introductions and show you some of the things that they're doing, and then they will present about their podcasts, and you will hear all kinds of cool stuff. And then we're going to have an open uh, time at the end, probably 20 minutes to do Q&A, to ask whatever questions you'd like. So with that, I'm going to get started. Um, first presenter will be Dr. James Phelan, who teaches and writes about narrative theory, including the Project Narrative Podcast right here. Um, he also would examines medical humanities, the English and American novel, especially from modernism to the present and nonfiction narrative. He's the co-author or author of 10 books and editor or co-editor of another 10, as well as approximately 175 essays, which is 174 more than I have. So congrats. Um, David Staley is here as well, and he is an associate professor in the Department of History, where he teaches courses in digital history and historical methods. He is also the host of Voices of Excellence from the College of Arts and Sciences that you see here. He is the author of Historical Imagination and Alternate, Alternative Universities, among others. So that's Dr. Staley. Dr. Elena Faulis is a student-centered educator with over 15 years of experience in higher ed. She is an Ohio State alumnus and holds BA and MA degrees in Spanish and Latin American literature and a PhD in comparative literature and cultural studies. She hosts the Ohio Abla podcast here, and her research and teaching interests include U.S. Latino, Latina literature, Spanish for heritage learners, and oral histories. Uh, Zoe Thompson is an associate professor of English. She hosts the Sinister Myth podcast right there and is the author of three books of poetry published by Blood Axe, Hand and Skull, Conquest, and The Secret. Uh, uh, who's next? Uh, Paul Kottheimer is a multimedia specialist with 22 years of experience working for the Arts and Sciences Technology Services Studio. He enjoys audio recording, production, photography, and video post-production. He began recording and supporting podcasts in 2004 and continues to be an enthusiastic proponent of the medium today. Doug Dangler is me, holds a BA in chemistry and biology from the University of Toledo, MA and PhD in English from the Ohio State University. He produces the Voices of Excellence podcast and is the host and producer of the Craft podcast since 2013, which airs weekly on WCBE. He regularly produces horror fiction and other socially unacceptable ideas. So welcome, everyone, to this discussion about podcasts. And I'm going to uh, turn it over now to Dr. Phelan to begin talking about his podcast. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, sure. I'll try to be brief. Um, so the Project Narrative podcast is a, just I'll give a general description and then talk a little bit about how we got started and so what our purposes are, and then some details about how it works. Um, so the Project Narrative podcast is a two-person session in which a guest who works in the field of narrative theory reads a short narrative and then discusses it with a host. And so far, I've been the host. And the podcast usually lasts from about 45 to 60 minutes um, with you know, 20 to 30 uh, minutes devoted to the reading of the narrative. Um, so why do we begin? Well, I think part of it is the fact that you know, my sense and that of my colleagues that we're in the era of podcasts. And if you don't have a podcast, you're not legit. No. <laughs> Um, so we want to be legit. Uh, also, I'd say, you know, I think I was inspired by David's, uh, David Staley's work, and you know, he invited me on his podcast, and we had a good session and listened to some of the other ones. And, uh, you know, well, if he, David can do it, maybe we could do it, uh, something uh, along the same lines. Uh, we were also um, inspired, I think I was particularly inspired by um, the New Yorker Fiction podcast, which um, functions as um, writers who have published stories in The New Yorker um, come on the podcast. They select 
as any story from the archive, and then they discuss it with uh, Deborah Treisman, who's the fiction editor of the New Yorker. And I listened to that, and I thought it was um, quite enjoyable and, and insightful. I thought, well, if writers could talk about it, well, maybe we could have narrative scholars uh, doing something similar. Um, and then the uh, other reason I think I want to mention is that when I floated the idea um, to my colleagues and to uh, graduate students uh, connected with Project Narrative, the graduate students were more excited and enthusiastic about this idea than about anything else that I proposed uh, during my time as director of Project Narrative. So uh, as far as purposes, what we're trying to do um, is to reach a broader audience than our narrative theory scholarship, uh, you know, published in journals and academic books does. Um, and part of our thinking is that, you know, people might be inclined to get interested in some of these narrative theoretical uh, issues and, its, and their consequences um, if they know that they're going to be, uh, they're going to get a story by a writer like Zadie Smith uh, and then an intelligent discussion of the story. Um, we also hope, uh, you know, in terms of our purposes, that we, we are creating content uh, that can be used in classrooms. Um, and I've heard from people that they're going to use one or more of our episodes in that way. And uh, as I think about my teaching uh, for the fall, I'm also trying to think about how to incorporate uh, some of the podcast uh, content. So as far as practical details, um, I'll say, you know, we're new to the podcast medium, uh, and I'm hoping to learn more uh, from everyone today. Um, but we've been doing one per month since October 2021. Um, and that's our plan to keep to make it a monthly thing. Um, and we we record in the a ASC studio um, and Doug and Paul and Scott Sprague. They're really a pleasure to work with. Um, we do the recording in studio so far. We're going to branch out and try to do some remotely. Um, but then Paul does some post-production work that includes inserting our theme music and an excerpt from the story uh, under discussion as a kind of teaser. Um, the podcasts are available on the OSU site and via Apple Podcasts. And then we advertise through various listservs and also on Twitter and Facebook. And I'm also very interested in learning more about how to get the word uh, more widely disseminated. So I'll stop there and say thank you for listening. Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, next up is David Staley. Thank you, Doug. Uh, well, thank you both for uh, organizing this panel, uh, but also uh, for the invitation that you gave me uh, three, almost four years ago, I suppose, the idea uh, for the podcast. Uh, initially, the idea was uh, the college wanted to do a podcast around the Science Sunday series. And Doug, Doug had asked me if, if, if I were interested in hosting such a thing. And I said, well, I would be interested in hosting, but uh, I'm not certain if I wanted it to be limited just to the sciences, especially if someone that comes uh, from the humanities side of campus. And so I suggested, what about the idea of, of doing something uh, across the, all of the arts and uh, all, ac uh, all across the arts and sciences? And Doug immediately latched on to that, I uh, latched on to that idea. Part of my argument was that a podcast like that, I think, is needed today, especially when the arts and sciences are so readily ignored or ill considered across, well, both the university and maybe the wider public. I didn't realize it at the time, but uh, I came to realize that uh, I was engaging in public facing scholarship, as uh, as Jim has just suggested. And I think that's that's going to be one of the themes that you're going to hear from um, the other panelists today. Um, I was reading an essay uh, by Mark Kerrigan the other day. From uh, He's from the University of Manchester, and he's observed that uh, uh, our pivot to the digital during the pandemic has meant that other forms of media have arisen as sites for research. And obviously, these existed before the pandemic, but I think they've been maybe accelerated by the pandemic. 
And in fact, he would uh, argue, he asks if we're in fact not witnessing the emergence of what he calls the audible university, meaning one that features audiobooks and text to speech and speech to text transcription services, and obviously also things like podcasts. In a sense, we are shifting or moving the site of scholarship from page to screen uh, to voice or sound. And in fact, one of the things that I'm wondering with uh, the rise of podcasts is if this isn't uh, also represents a revival of public speaking as a core cognitive ability, something that I know that uh, Lena and Zoe and, and Jim and I uh, all practice, I suppose, in hosting our podcasts. Um, Kerrigan argues that podcasts and other such uh, oral media uh, represent something he calls research listening, which I think is a really interesting concept. Uh, he says, there seems to be a significant pool of scholars for whom listening has become a significant mode of engagement with ideas, and we need to grapple with what this means for knowledge production. And I'm not certain we have fully sufficiently grappled with this. And I think that's the necessity uh, of, of this panel. Uh, Kerrigan goes on and says, I'm convinced this turn toward listening could be enormously valuable for scholarship in expanding the range of ways in which we talk about, share, and engage with ideas. Doing this would mean engaging with listening on its own terms, rather than seeing it in comparison with reading. I don't think there's anything that sparks conversation quite like a good podcast episode. Ideas come to life in different ways through listening to dialogue rather than reading a text. Uh, which I, I, again, I think maybe that's something that we could, we could discuss as well. And I, again, I think something that we share across all of our podcasts. Uh, I have come to view or to understand voices as like an edited volume. Uh, I've had about 170 contributors thus far and a number that's still growing that I have curated over uh, three years or so. Uh, and again, I think, of, I think of the podcast almost like an edited volume. Uh, in my department, at least, and maybe maybe there's the, the case is different in other departments, but the podcast is not treated as scholarship for purposes of promotion and tenure. Uh, I think it's time to change that. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Um, and next up, I keep losing my place, and it is Dr. Elena Fowlis. Hi. Well, I am the host and producer of Ohio, um, not Ohio Habla, Latino Stories. <laughs> um, it, it was Ohio Habla, but uh, part of the reason that I changed the name of the podcast was because, um, you know, the purpose of this uh, podcast was to amplify Latinx voices. And it started primarily with... Um, you know, local leaders, researchers, uh, things that were happening in Ohio. But over the the years, which is almost five years, and uh, we started November 2017, um, I really have uh, interviewed or had guests that are, um, you know, working across, across the nation. Um, and so I decided that it would be more appropriate to change the name and to make it... Um, you know, reflect a more uh, nationwide um, conversation about Latinx issues. And the reason why I started this too was because, um, again, I wanted to, to um, connect with the, the Latinx community um, and offer a way to, um, you know, a platform for them to talk about the work that they were doing in the community and in higher ed, um, I also wanted to use it as a uh, tool for my students, either as consumers, right, as uh, they listen to different topics, uh, different um, issues that affect our community. But I also wanted to train them on how to uh, produce, host and produce a podcast. And so for one of my classes, for example, um, they have to go through the whole, you know, process of producing their own podcast, 
is not always public, but when they choose to, they can also make it public and contribute to Latino stories. So, um, you know, so I've had a few students that have worked on that, uh, worked on that um, process and, and then decide that they want it, um, they want their interview or their podcast to be public. Um, so, um, yeah, I have been in, the topics are very varied. Um, they're anything from uh, research, um, you know, culture, um, just society issues, um, uh, it, I've had um, guests who are also artists. Um, so we've had a couple of musicians in the, in the studio. We had <clears throat> a poet that, you know, part of their interview <clears throat> was also them either playing a song or a couple of songs um, or, you know, performing their, their poetry, for example. So, you know, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we obviously, like most of us, switched to Zoom uh, podcasting. Um, but I also was, you know, one of the things that I think is so um, timely or neat about podcasts is that, that you can tap into relevant issues right away, right? So when we were in the middle of the pandemic, I had a panel of low, um of community, um, local community um, leaders, and we discussed how uh, the pandemic had been affecting, affecting specifically the Latinx community. I also had a panel, um, you know, from other uh, professors outside um, the state talk about um, Black Lives Matter within the Latinx community. Um, and so, you know, and so it was really, um, it, it really is a venue to, you know, learning, uh, uh, conversing with others um, and really bringing um, current issues into um, the classroom, for example. And so the students, you know, I assign some of the podcasts now that are relevant to some of the topics that we're seeing in the classroom. So um, I've used this as a pedagogical tool of, you know, learning, just further learning about this issue. And then also, you um, for the students uh, to use and learn um, for the interviewing skills, how to produce a podcast, how to, you know, make sure that you're practicing. Um, one, um, another unique feature, feature of this podcast is that it's bilingual. So some of the interviews are in English, some of them are in Spanish, and some of them code switch. So we have both languages there. Um, and so, yeah, that's all um, I'll say about that right now. And Zoe Thompson. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to quickly drop a link in the chat, which is to the podcast in case anybody wants to just have a browse of it while I'm talking. So I've just popped that in there. Hi, so I'm Dr. Zoe Bridley Thompson, and I'm here to talk about the podcast Sinister Myth. Uh, Sinister Myth challenges cultural mythologies about sexuality in the West because very often they encourage, perpetuate, or foster violence against women and minorities. Sexuality and sex education are big themes of this podcast, themes that could not be more important given the recent challenge to Roe versus Wade, as well as the many legal precedents on which many human rights for marginalized people are based related to that judgment. The series is made up of 30 minute interviews with writers, academics, and people working on community projects. Alongside the interviews, the series also includes 10 minute sinister bite size, which offer short sound bites from experts with advice on allyship and more. And there are also sinister keywords, which feature short conversations about language and how words can encourage or harm, uh, or encourage harm against minority groups. Uh, Sinister Myth was generated through an Ohio State Affordable Learning Exchange, and LAX grant, and it was created by myself and originally a student in the English department, Brandon Walsh. Um, it was always a teaching and learning tool for my course, Sexuality Studies 5620, as well as a conduit for students to express opinions about issues related to sexuality that applied to them. I always assume in my teaching that as much as I can teach my students, they can also teach me. 
There's no limit to learning, and in line with the recent volume, Who Are Universities For?, I think that a different model, a less hierarchical one, would serve us well. But why sinister myth? I always stress to my students the importance of storytelling, how it can be a tool that helps us to understand ourselves. The origin of the word story can be traced back to its root in Latin and Greek to the word wise man. And it's often true that in consuming stories, we're seeking something, perhaps some kind of wisdom or truth. Stories, however, do not always support ethical ways of being in the world, and they can be used to reproduce harmful narratives, especially when they're based on stereotypes. The problem is that sometimes stories can be used to confirm people's prejudices, and such stories sometimes become myths in the sense that the narratives are used to explain or justify behaviours that are far from ethical, just or compassionate. Take, for example, the association of African-American people with violence, which extends its long tendrils out of slavery in America and the Jim Crow backlash to emancipation when racist white people needed an excuse to justify imprisoning and policing black individuals and communities. Professor Trevor Lindsay came onto our podcast to talk about the issue in relation to black girls, commenting on how social media trends like hashtag say her name can intervene in such violence and demand justice. Or we could talk about how narratives about trans people frame them, especially people of color, as deceptive, a myth that allows transphobic people to justify their mistreatment of that particular community. Erin Upchurch, then director of the Kaleidoscope Center for LGBTQ Youth in Columbus, came in to talk to us about the treatment of trans kids in Ohio communities and presented a different way that centered on the kids' needs and wants. Sinister Myth then seeks to challenge narratives as well as looking for ways to learn how to be better allies to vulnerable communities. The title was based on a feminist zine in England in the 1980s called Sinister Women and also on a journal titled Sinister Wisdom. The word sinister in both cases is used as a subversive way to suggest how narratives that seem natural or straightforward about what or who is bad can sometimes be lacking. Sinister Wisdom notes how the title queers assumed knowledge and recognizes the power of language to reflect our diverse experiences. To organize the podcast, I drew on the student body, some postgrads, but mainly undergraduates. And some people were surprised that I was happy to work on such a complex project with undergraduates, but I found they were a self-selecting group volunteers who cared passionately about issues around sexuality and violence. Often they had important things that they wanted to say. And many of them came from my sexuality studies class on which they also learned skills about podcasting. The podcasts were then used in that class as an alternative to a textbook, part of what David Staley described in talking about definitely the Audible University. Students learn from other students as well as from experts that we featured in longer interviews. They also got to know local heroes doing anti-violence work in the community. So we were able to bring them into the university space. I feel like I'm just about to cough and I'm almost at the end. (laughs) But, excuse me. So the podcast come to a close now, but I am hoping to set up spin-offs and similar projects. And I really am going to cough now, so I'll stop right there. Sorry about that. If you uh, get a chance <laughs> to get a maybe get a drink of water right now, it'd be good. Um, and then Paul Kottheimer is from ASC Studio. So, Paul. Hi, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> can you see my screen, Doug? OK, cool. Uh, sorry, this is a setting screen for Zoom. So I'm going to start off with just giving you guys some tips for better podcast recording in Zoom. Um, I start my timer for five minutes too. I don't want to. Okay. So um, the first thing you want to do in uh, in Zoom uh, for a better recording is to go to the recording tab under the settings and record a separate audio file for each participant. That will allow you to uh, do all kinds of things. Uh, for example, if someone's the easiest thing is if someone's really loud and the other person's really soft, you can uh, mix that and uh, fix it. Um, <clears throat> someone coughs while someone else is talking, you can fix that as well. Um, 
And then under the audio settings in Zoom, there is a suppressed background noise, which is set on auto um, by default. You can change that to low if you're in a very quiet recording environment. And, um, and I'll just leave that at that. And then um, over to Sound Gym. This is a really cool kind of, um, uh, it's basically like a self-teaching how to be better at audio. Um, this is just a very short example. You should be able to hear this. This is with the EQ on. And it's asking me to determine with the EQ off now. EQ on where the boost is. And I'm going to select 2000 Hertz and it was 8000 Hertz. So that was pretty wrong. Second one. Um, get the idea you can do the same thing with volume and this this tunes your ear it makes you better at uh, listening and then choosing to um how many dbs for example to add in order to make one track equal the other one this is called soundgym.co um this is a short video showing a uh eq technique called search and destroy um i hope you can hear it Welcome to the podcast of the Global Mobility Project at Ohio State University. My name is Vera Bruder Sung, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department what's of happening right now Ohio State. Is that this? The Global the Mobility Project of, integrates uh, the insights of the arts, humanities, and social That's sciences about, to facilitate a conversation exactly, on like how local culture and individual louder. decision making inform and, what's and reflect is, the complex swept. global forces so behind as mobility. As you sweep the center frequency of the boost, our guest today is photographer and artist Susan Mizellis. She has devoted much of her decades-long career to documenting places of social and political turmoil and displaced peoples, including those from Latin America, response, Kurdistan, and boosted. Cape Verde. She is also interested in the life of photographs and I over said, time. The reason that you want to do this is you want to get rid of a nasally part of a voice, of an image's or you want to get rid of a problem context. frequency range. Mizellis is a member voice. of the Magnum Photos Cooperative, and a MacArthur Fellow, and a recipient of many awards, including the Robert Capa Gold Medal. And let me stop and say that again. Problem including care of. the Robert. I'll leave a compression and I'll jump to uh, what I call integrated sustained podcasting success. Um, the idea of the integration is to integrate um, your actual personality and things that actually interest you in uh, your, your podcasting to make it more interesting for yourself and for others. Um, and sustain so that you won't become bored with it. Um, my case study for the idea of integrated, po integrated sustained podcasting success is uh, this guy, uh, Robert Wright. He's a former Princeton professor. I'm sorry. I think, yeah, I think he went to print. He went to Princeton and he's a former Yale professor. Um, he taught evolution, evolutionary psychology. He used to write for the New Republic and his former fellow journalist writer on the right there, Mickey Kaus. Um, he does a podcast with every Friday night and I am addicted to it. And the reason is they um, is the reason is a little drama goes a long way. These two guys disagree on just about everything. Um, Mickey on the right voted for Trump. Robert Wright on the left finds that abhorrent. And um, they have an intellectually honest debate. They have mutual respect and they disagree about everything. So um, my idea uh, back to integrated uh, sustained podcasting success is that don't be afraid to disagree with each other. Don't be afraid of a little bit of drama. And uh, I think I'm done with my five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm going to talk now uh, and show some slides uh, about uh, the sort of stuff that I'm doing and uh, working with David Staley uh, mostly because the Voices of Excellence arises from the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, we, uh, I, I do the production work on it. And so 
basically uh, how it works is that David um, has a list of people he suggests. I inv- he invites them. I do the scheduling of them. Before COVID, these were all in place held here at the ASC Tech Studio in 142 Haggerty Hall. Uh, but now we often record through the Zoom interface that we're working with right now. The audio quality obviously isn't as good as what we got when we recorded in the studio, but it's often more convenient for guests to meet online than at the studio. And the audio is generally good enough for a podcast. As long as the person on the other end has a, you know, a decent mic, you can see that David and I have sort of the same mic. I just picked this one up today. uh, that was brought back. And uh, that's a, a big thing that I would suggest to folks is work on getting a good mic. Um, we can help you in the studio, look at some of those, try some of them out, whatever. Any USB mic is going to be pretty much light years ahead of uh, most other oops, uh, mics that you can you can uh, get for your, uh, your computer. Sorry, I'm having a slight computer problem here. Um, okay. So at any rate, um, and speaking of the studio, we're going to take just a moment here for a uh, word from our sponsor. If you're in the College of Arts and Sciences at the Ohio State University, you can use the studio and you can get a lot better audio, giving you that professional podcaster sound. We record the audio and Paul will master it. So come on down to 142 Haggerty Hall and hear the magic. Um, and here are some of the people hearing the magic and making the magic and a bird that was attacking one of our drones. So I'd just like to throw that in because we, you don't get enough birds attacking drones in these sorts of presentations. At any rate, after David decides what they want, to, what he wants to talk to, who he wants to talk to, um, the process is a well-oiled machine after 170 some episodes. Stan, we send out an email invitation that tells the guests what they want to, what we would like them to do in advance. If they agree, uh, they get an acceptance email with more specific info about the guest's responsibilities and um, some links to an OSU Qualtrics form that I'm going to share with you to give you an idea of how far in depth we go with some of the stuff to help make people relaxed on the mic because a lot of people haven't done this kind of thing before. So, for example, we go through and say, you know, we get their name, their email address, obviously that connects it to the person. We ask for a, a photo of them so we can put it on our website. We col- this is, again, all the stuff that we collect in advance. Um, to get the website to learn about their research, ask them about current research. How do you describe it to people outside your field? Because that's a really important aspect of Voices of Excellence is to get the idea of what is the way that you explain it to people who aren't um, experts in the field as you are. And uh, then we ask for some surprising results. Um, What got them interested in the field is a very common question that David asks because it sort of lets people bring it around to here's my story, here's what got me into the field. And a lot of times it's sort of surprising. People would start out in an entirely different area and then they would end up with a doctorate in English. I have a bachelor's in chemistry and biology and, you know, I ended up getting a doctorate in English. That's a weird uh, route to get there. And uh, I think David would say that he's heard many other stories like that. Um, we asked them what's next on their research and how does the OSU, uh, Ohio State University and the College of Arts and Science fit for these folks as researchers and teachers, um, because that gives them a chance to reflect on the university and reflect on what they like about it, how it fits well with what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very positive thing for the university And um, then one of the things that uh, as a podcaster, I think you will really want to look at is what are the tags that you want to use? Because that's how people are going to find you. And um, I think we've all put up our Twitter feeds and you can look at the sorts of tags that we use and find out where folks uh, identify their interests and things like that. And finally, uh, one of the areas, and, and this is where I thought Tom Evans might have just a moment uh, to to uh, throw in here before we go to Q&A, is that we use for some SoundCloud and for others different distributors. SoundCloud, for example, allows people to um, respond back to folks like this interview, this recent interview. Um, and 
but one of the things that SoundCloud doesn't do that Tom Evans's uh, system through the Ohio State University will do is allow you to put transcripts up. And uh, the transcripts are really very helpful for folks to, you know, obviously if they have difficulty hearing, that's how they're going to come into the podcast. And that's one of the areas that I think is the next big push for us. So um, that is a quick overview of what we're doing. And uh, I thought I would take just a second to say, Tom, if you would like to say anything, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you don't have anything prepped, that's fine. But as soon as I saw you, I thought, oh, that great Tom Evans could maybe say one thing about podcasting at Ohio State University because he controls the Ohio State University podcast portal that um, everybody here uh, broadcasts with. Thanks, so, Doug. Sure. Um, I'm going to put that on my business card. The great. I'll add that to my the great. Card. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. So um, if anybody is working with uh, Doug or Paul or is not in arts and sciences and has questions about podcasting and how to um, get started, what are some hosting op opportunities, what support can is available um, we are happy to have that conversation and, um, you can simply send an email to podcast at osu.edu and it'll most likely be myself that will end up responding and having a consult with you and we can help get your podcast stood up in a way that makes it manageable on your end, as well as, uh, published up on Apple and, uh, branded at the university and, um, we're happy and here to help support uh, what it is you want to do. And we do have a new process now. So all of our new podcasts that are hosted through us in OTDI are uh, essentially placed in their own WordPress website space. And it makes it um, extremely manageable and very flexible and convenient to schedule out future episodes and do some placeholder episodes and things like that. But happy to talk more with others if you have questions. And so now I think um, Scott can help us open the floor for questions. And one of the, by the way, one of the things I wanted to point out is um, Paul can take you on a deep dive into audio, but we can also help you uh, to not have to go quite that deep if you don't want to. And one of the great things about Tom's new system is that I think it automates a lot of stuff for folks and makes it uh, a simpler experience. And, you know, speaking for myself, been having been doing audio of this variety for uh, 12, 13, 14 years, something like that, the, the bar to entry has gotten so much lower and so much better. Um, you know, we didn't have USB mics of any quality when I started out, and now they're quite good. So, you know, I, I just want to encourage people, if they're thinking about doing this, you know, it's, it's doable. Get out there and, you know, give it a try. And if you need some help, ask the people on this panel. So Tom, uh, Scott, how do we, uh, how do we open this up? Yeah, I have a couple poll questions I'm happy to, to share out and I would love for the, the panel to kind of respond as well, maybe verbally, but I'm interested on the people that are on the call, what their experiences with podcasting, whether they're just listeners that are interested in podcasting, whether they're kind of beginners and have already started creating one to five, uh, moderate five to 20 and, uh, or if they're more advanced podcasters in the room that are doing, you know, 20 plus podcasts so far. So, um, I'll open that poll and let people respond, but Doug, I'd love to hear kind of down the line, what the experience in the room is from the, the panelists. Go panelists go. I think at this stage, you're all, uh, you know, in the 20 plus or 40 plus or 50, 100. Jim, how many podcasts do you have currently? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. No, um, I'm, I'm the novice. Uh, I think we have six. Very cool. Maybe seven, one a month. All right. And the rest of you are probably in the, the experts uh, advanced area with 20 plus, I would assume. Paul, yeah. David. Yeah. Oh, I think Doug. I think Doug might have the uh, title for the most. I'm pretty sure he's in the multiple hundreds. Uh, and yeah, I, yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah, <laughs> I've been putting people to sleep in Columbus since uh, 2008. 
All right. So, so we have a lot Elena, of listeners in the room. Go Elena ahead. Sorry, is, Elena. Uh, Elena's got a weekly podcast and she's been going for at least four years, I want to say. Um, so. Almost five in yeah, November. So, yeah. So that's a pretty good uh, schedule to keep up. Yeah. Um, I'm also interested with the kind of panel <clears throat> for folks who are interested and I'll, I'll, um, I'll put this up here. So we have a, a lot of listeners and a few beginners in the room. Um, but for folks who are maybe interested in uh, starting a podcast, uh, what is the first maybe two steps or two key pieces of advice you'd give people thinking going into creating their own podcast for their courses or, you know, whatever the reason may be. May I chime in to begin? Yeah, uh, please. Don't, yeah, don't do it yourself. Um, make certain you have uh, people like um, like Paul and Doug uh, to to really sort of run the show. There's no way I could do this by myself. Yeah, I I would agree. I echo that exact advice. Um, it's it's easy to go out and spend four hundred dollars on gear and then start your podcast and then I realize oh I don't enjoy this and I hate the sound of my voice and I suck <laughs> as well. So like, why not go to someone that already has the gear and just do the first one just to see how it sounds. Did you yeah. Say has the beer. <laughs> I agree. The I gear. agree with that. I mean, oh, <laughs> with podcasts the you know, it's audio. So you have to understand how that works and, you know, and liking your voice is, you know, I always tell my students, because when we do this kind of work with the students are like, Oh, I hate my voice. I'm like, well, you have to get over this because this is not about you. <laughs> it's about the story. It's about the content. It's about the person that you're interviewing and really uh, documenting those experiences. And so, you know, I tell them like, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard or had anybody that says, oh, I just left my voice on, you know, on their <laughs> recording. Like I've never, every single person that I've met say, um, they say, oh, I don't like my, you know, I don't like it, but it's not about that. And I think um, what, what's going to make it a good podcast, obviously that, you know, having a person, you know, that helps you with the sound, uh, but also just being prepared, right? Um, so part of the conversations that I have with my students is making sure that you sound prepared, right? That you sound confident um, because mm -hmm. you've uh, rehearsed and you know, you know, this is, this is um, good production, you know, notes, but also like you're respecting the person that you're interviewing, right. By being prepared. Um, and, um, and also like helping them be at ease. A lot of the people that we interview, um, they've never done this before. They've never, you know, and so whether they come to the studio or go, or we do it via zoom, um, they can be nervous and it's up to us, the host to make them feel comfortable, um, and so that comes across, you know, and, and audio is all we have. So, you know, we need to make sure that those voices that you're hearing sound prepared, confident, and easy, easy to listen to, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just second that in the sense of, uh, you know, preparation. Uh, so, you know, David does a questionnaire. It sounds like it's doing research. I'm sure Zoe does relevant stuff. What we do is uh, we we have a discussion uh, ahead of time. And what we're trying to do is share what things that we want to be sure to touch on without scripting things so that the podcast itself feels like a conversation and, and actually is uh, a conversation about what we're talking about. I think the other things I would add have to do with, you know, thinking about uh, audience and, and purpose. What are we, what are we trying to accomplish with this discussion? Who are we trying to reach? You know, uh, that kind of stuff. One final thing about voice. Um, early in my teaching career, I got a discursive evaluation that said uh, everything about this course was boring, including and especially the instructor's voice. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> what, I, was um, your, what was your reaction to that? What did you change <laughs> anything or did you just decide it was that student? Yeah, I, I wasn't about to take voice lessons or um, anything. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, no, I, I, fortunately, I didn't get that. I didn't get a lot of that. So I, I was able to say, well, this is, you know, one person's uh, opinion. I was told, Jim, uh, before one of my podcasts that I had a face for face for radio. Yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, um, uh, piggyback on something Elena was talking about. That was actually kind of a surprise for me. The number of uh, guests uh, who talk about being nervous or, or, or uncertain. Uh, and uh, this isn't the reason we do it, but I think it's it's something that does help to um, uh, put people at ease is as, as both you and Jim know, since you've both been guests on my podcast, we'll spend maybe 10 minutes before we actually start recording, just talking about the nature of the conversation here, the sorts of things I want to ask you about. Uh, here's some you know, things to, 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 to be mindful of. One of the things we tell them is because, uh, uh, it's, it, it's, uh, edited in post-production. Uh, it's okay to flub up. Uh, I tell them right up front, I flub up all the time. All that stuff gets gets edited out. Uh, you don't have to sound perfect. Uh, but Paul makes you sound perfect. So uh, that's uh, that's another reason why it's important to have people that know what they're doing. <laughs> so I, I did that poll and it looks like we have, um, you know, a, a good handful of people that are absolutely interested in starting podcasts here in the next year, which is awesome. Uh, we have a couple people that are like, no way. There's obviously too much work in this. There's too much time. There's too much energy. And then, then some folks that are not sure. So I'm interested from the panel for folks who maybe are not prepared to kind of start this themselves. Are any of you using podcasts that other people are producing within your courses or within um, context as resources to kind of encourage students to check out or uh, folks to, to listen into? Well, I, I haven't done it yet, but I, I, you know, I've been listening pretty faithfully to the New Yorker Fiction Podcast, and I think I will bring that in um, to, to my courses, uh, have the students, uh, you know, listen and you know, signing the stories and so on, um, because, it, the, you know, it's a nice combination for narrative theory courses to have writers talking about other writers. Um, and, you know, if, we, if we're doing one of the stories that they're talking about, then that you know it's adding voices and and that's that's the one where i'm very impressed by the preparation that the host does and the writers are always smart yeah i'd agree with that and um i really love listening to some of the poetry foundation uh podcasts i don't know if you've come across those where they'll take a poem and the poet themselves will read it and then they'll they'll talk about it. And um, it's just always really fascinating. And I've thought about, um, I've been thinking about some new projects for podcasts now moving on from this last one. And one thing I'm interested in is this idea of like having um, students involved in interviewing and responding to poems. Um, and so that's one idea I had, which I think would be, really interesting was to be actually get them involved and because I'm a poet myself I know a lot of poets so I'm kind of hoping I can rope them in to come and read their poems on the podcast and then maybe involve the students in interviewing them so um, I'm excited about that idea we'll see if we can uh, get that going. I don't teach so I, don't I was going to say, <laughs> I'm interested as well. This is a question that we get a lot. Um, when you're either subscribing to a podcast or creating a podcast, this is all personal preference. What is the typical length that you're looking for? And I'll, I'll launch this for our participants. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just kind of personal preference. But I'm interested to hear from our podcasters on here what they're aiming for when either um, subscribing and listening to a podcast that they like or creating their own. For, for me, well, it depends on the subject, right? But I think uh, my podcasts are typically 30 to 60 minutes. And when with the longer podcasts, I have more than one guest. Um, so that's why, you know, it just, we run a little longer. But I think 30 minutes is a sweet spot, you know, where it's not too long, it's not too short. Um, so that's my personal uh, preference. Yeah. And for ours, we try to have a mixture, actually. So, yeah, I think you're right. When you're doing an interview, I think 30 minutes is that sweet spot for sure of just having enough time to um, really go into a topic, but also 
um, not, it not being too long. Um, but I do think it's quite nice to break those up with shorter ones, which was why we kind of introduced this um, kind of bite-sized podcast idea. Um, what I found was that sometimes I'd have really great material that I couldn't include in that 30 minutes. And sometimes I try and sort of pick out sections that were just a kind of a bite-sized chunk of, of, of something on a particular topic. And I'd be able to, to still use that, which was really good. And then also just having kind of little 10 minute breakdowns can work for certain things. So we'd have sometimes case studies, like a story that had been reported in the news. And we would, um, you know, have just like a 10 minute outline of how it was reported, if there was something troubling about the way it was reported. And those worked well, as well as um, having keywords, which was where we kind of looked at language, you know, what a term means, whether it's understood. So for one podcast, we looked at the term gaslighting and two of us would just have a conversation about it for 10 minutes and, and say, you know, what does gaslighted mean? Do people understand what it means? Um, you know, how does it relate to intimate partner violence? Um, you know, what, how does it manifest itself? And just this idea that, that just that 10 minutes can give people a lot of power in terms of like understanding a concept like that. So I think having a mixture can be really good as well. Uh, for me, I've done a various amount of broadcast and it, they dictate the time. So you end up, um, and, and a lot of times the guest will dictate the time. Uh, so you get 10 minutes with somebody. It's a hard in, hard out. Um, you get nothing in advance. You can't give them questions. And, you know, that's just the nature of the beast doing it, um, the kind of podcasting I do. Uh, so, yeah, it, it varies, I think, wi widely and can be really complicated if you want to ask a particular question, but you have 10 minutes uh, if you want to explore a topic, it's 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 pushing it to get it in the way you want it to. Awesome. Well, Doug, you have about one minute left, so I want to make sure if you, there's anything you need to close out or share out with folks, you can. I popped a link to a survey in there for folks to give us some feedback and also a link to our closing session that will be following this. So any closing remarks, Doug? Uh, David Staley is available for uh, parties and uh, just to contact me, I'll, I'll, I'll work on the fee. No, thank you all very much. You're all, I uh, appreciate all of the podcasters being willing to come and, and talk today. And if you don't, haven't had a chance to check them out, uh, check them all out. And, um, you know, I, I think they're all on Tom's um, OSU portal, which is a, another great place to go. I think he dropped that in the uh, the chat session there. And so, you know, all power to uh, the panelists and to uh, the great Tom Evans.